Hi everyone, Mark here from PondologySolutions.com and in this video I want to go over phosphorus. Talk more about phosphorus and how to manage it in your pond or lake. You know, we cannot talk about things like algae without also including a discussion on phosphorus because phosphorus is one of those things along with nitrogen base type nutrients that can definitely help algae grow. So in terms of phosphorus, what is it? Where does it come from? Well, phosphorus is a natural occurring element. It is found in all living things and widely in our environment. It is a component of life, essentially uh, a component of life. It's in our DNA, RNA, of every living thing. So it's, it's a necessity. But it also, in terms of our discussion on algae, it is one of the three main nutrients required for plant growth, the others being nitrogen and potassium. Phosphorus is found in nature, in rock deposits, in the soil, in organic matter, many, many places. In our modern life, we will see phosphorus used in industrial settings and in agriculture and it is mined for those purposes. It's a primary ingredient in man-made fertilizers and things like detergents. When we look at the relationship between phosphorus and algae, it's very important to understand that although there are other nutrients like nitrogen that we can talk about, phosphorus in my mind is the most influential. Some say it is the limiting factor for algae growth. And what that means is, is that if phosphorus is low, algae growth may be limited despite other nutrients being present and potentially higher. In contrast, if phosphorus is high, algae growth may be stimulated and enhanced even though other nutrients are fairly minimal. And so, when someone has an ongoing algae issue and it becomes or seems to be harder to control than what we might see as normal, I start to really look into the phosphorus side of things because you get very suspicious. It's such a huge driver of algae. And it actually is such a strong stimulant of algae growth that some things, uh, I just did a video recently on the use of ultrasound for managing algae on large ponds and large lakes. Ultrasound can be a very good tool for those things, but if phosphorus is too high, even that technology may have trouble keeping up with the growth rate of the algae. So the real meat and potatoes of this discussion is, all right, we know what phosphorus is, we know where it comes from, and we know it feeds algae, but how do I manage it if I have a problem? Well, you want to test for it. And I typically would suggest finding a lab locally or statewide or someone to test for it. You can use some test strips, uh, very simple test strips you can find on Amazon. I'll include a link below for those. Those are very general, but they will give you an idea of, of where your phosphorus level is in a pond. But I think when you really want to get into it, probably have it professionally done so you can get very specific numbers. It'll be measured in parts per million or milligrams per liter maybe parts per billion, but you'll be able to see where you stand. And um, generally speaking, if you have much phosphorus present and you have a very chronic algae problem, that's going to be part of the story. So how do you reduce or manage phosphorus in a pond environment? Well, I think the first place to start, and I think the best place, is to consider limiting the phosphorus that gets into the pond in the first place. And that means controlling runoff, uh, you can create buffer zones, uh, vegetative strips around the pond, which can help absorb some of this nutrient from runoff that may come from fertilized ground. Uh, you want to be aware of fertilizer use. All the fertilizers we use on our, our lawns and grasses and crops even, most if not, well, most will contain phosphorus. Uh, you can get phosphorus-free versions, which you want to consider looking for, but most will have phosphorus. And they need to be correctly applied. Don't be excessive with them. Be judicious. And obviously, don't apply them 
at a point where maybe you've got rain coming in and ultimately there will be no time for the fertilizer to get absorbed into the soil and it just runs off into the pond and that's going to stimulate growth there. The other thing to look at is erosion control because phosphorus is in soil and any of this phosphorus rich soil that gets washed into the pond through erosion can help raise the level in the water. You can look at natural filtration mechanisms. As I mentioned, vegetative buffers, plant native grasses, shrubs, trees around the pond that act as natural filters. They all will absorb phosphorus and utilize it for growth and so you can definitely cut off some of this phosphorus intrusion into the pond with these types of vegetative buffers. The other thing you can look at on source streams that are above ground, which often, if you're in an agricultural area like I am, they will be loaded with phosphorus at certain times of the year. You can consider building constructed wetlands, places like bogs or uh, marshes or some kind of a, a, an area that has very high concentrations of veg vegetation that can absorb a lot of this nutrient before it gets into the main pond body. It's a, it's a good bit of work, but from a strategic point of view, doing that work ahead of it getting into the pond and then, or rather than trying to deal with it after it's in the pond, I think is a, a very prudent thing if you're able to do that. In pond treatments, once you have phosphorus in the pond itself and your readings are high, what can you do about it? Well, typically we would use binders or flocculants, which unfortunately they don't remove the element from the pond, they simply sequester it. But it can definitely make it uh, its bioavailability more limited to algae and thereby it can be helpful. So those that we would see commonly used in the industry, alum is one, it's aluminum sulfate and like all binders it will bind to the phosphorus, create a, uh, clumpy masses, make them heavy and they'll sink to the bottom and typically stay down there. Uh, phosphorus binders also come in other forms. Utrozorb is a brand that you'll see on the market and this uses a form of bentonite clay which can be a useful tool. And bentonite also will be used for lining the pond bottoms. Clay in general is good to hold water and keep from a, a, a pond leaking. And so you may find a use for bentonite clay in that regard. Calcium and magnesium oxide formulas are available. These come in various trade names. Uh, it will normally be listed as a non-alum type phosphate binder, and they can definitely work too. Whatever binder you're working with, you want to figure out, again, where your phosphate level is to start with and then test throughout the course of these applications to see that it's coming down. In the case of the Utrazorb, you will probably provide the level of phosphate that you have in the pond and they can recommend how much to use to bind this amount of phosphorus up. Uh, with the calcium and magnesium formulas, oftentimes you will start with a certain recommended dosage and over a period of repeated applications, we've seen the numbers come down after about 12 or 16 weeks of, of bi-weekly applications at a certain level. Um, so you need to use enough binder to, to match up or exceed the amount of phosphorus that you're trying to bind. That It sounds reasonable, I guess, but a lot of people just follow directions and say, I'm going to apply this binder once at this dosage, and then they think that that's all that it takes. And unfortunately, uh, with some of these products, you've got to use enough, long enough, and often enough to get the phosphorus bound up adequately to actually see a result in the algae support. So the other thing that you can look at is adding or increasing aeration. Aeration, and I, my preference is for subsurface bottom aeration because what you're doing with that is you are increasing circulation throughout the pond, which is very beneficial to many things, but our goal is to increase oxygen at the bottom of the pond, near the substrate. As you do that, you start to increase the binding capability of the phosphorus to get sequestered down there just due to the higher oxygen. And conversely, low oxygen will release more phosphorus from the sediment. So that's a very useful tool to consider 
Water circulators also are good for improving movement, preventing stagnation, things like that, and may help produce or prevent the buildup of phosphorus at the bottom of the pond. Sediment management is the final thing you can consider, and really dredging is the one way to physically remove accumulated sediment and phosphorus from the pond. It's the only way to actually physically of the pond. And it is costly at times, and it is pretty disruptive to the pond environment. Uh, you have to acknowledge those two things, but from the perspective of actual removal, it's the only way to get phosphorus out. Sediment capping is another option you can consider where you basically apply a layer of inert material. This could be sand or the aforementioned bentonite clay or clay in some form over the sediment that creates a barrier and locks the phosphorus in below that. Again, making it unavailable for algae above. So that may be an option to consider as well. At any rate, that's a quick rundown on phosphorus, uh, where it comes from, how it stimulates algae growth, and a few ways that you can deal with it if you find high levels in your pond. As always, if you have questions on anything, if you need help with your pond or pond algae issues, reach out to me. My name is Mark and I can be found at pondalgesolutions.com. I hope you have a great day wherever you are.